40% of the revenue was actually coming from foreigners. And it was going in, in this direction. And then the, the war on, on Gaza started on October 7th and uh, in Lebanon as well on October 8th. So the recent escalations uh, started about a month ago, but the ongoing war has been going on here for, for over a year. Uh, but not in Beirut at first. So when it started in Gaza, it took several days for people to realize what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. And so it was, I've been open for about uh, five or six weeks. And, you know, I was starting to build up the momentum. Mm -hmm. And then in, in a matter of few days, all the momentum that I was trying to build um, collapsed. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forward's workshop, It's Time to Become a Coffee Consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode one of a brand new five-part series with Joseph Sayer from Levant Cafe, or just Levant, if you like, in Beirut, Lebanon. Joseph, welcome to the podcast for the first time. Hi, Lee. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's my pleasure. First of all, I want to set the tone for everyone up front. Yes, Joseph is uh, in Beirut. Levant is in Beirut. This is a very challenging time. I mean, challenging is an understatement. I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody um, that is living in Beirut. But we are having a conversation in this series about adapting and surviving as a business in times of crisis. And Lebanon is experiencing a time of crisis right now. Uh, is that the right way to describe it, Joseph? Uh, crisis may even be... Uh, uh, Understating uh, it? Yes. Um, we have went to a financial crisis a few years ago. And uh, I think like what we're going on, what we're going through right now is like a true war uh, in right. Lebanon, so, uh, it is a crisis for business owners from many different aspects. Right. And so to not understate it, Levant is trying to survive as a business through wartime. And I am fascinated by your journey. I'm impressed by you as a business owner. Um, so why don't you help other people understand who you are so that they can really get to see why? I'm so impressed by you as a business owner. Thank you, Lee. Um, so the story behind Leva is uh, after having spent about 10 years abroad, I was living in, in Paris, in France, um, came back to, to Lebanon to uh, open a business. And the initial idea behind Leva uh, was once I was in Beirut, in Jamaize. So Jamaize is a neighborhood in Beirut where you have uh, most restaurants, bars, uh, art galleries, where the beautiful architecture is. So we were walking around with my French friends and I'm showing them this part of Beirut and they asked me to um, take them somewhere so that we can have some local sweets, some local desserts. And this is how I realized that in all this neighborhood, there is no place that sells uh, any of those desserts. And mm. most Lebanese pastry shops, they are designed for you to buy in bulk. So we buy our sweets in Lebanon by the kilo mm. uh, or by the dozen. So it's very difficult to get one unit. And this is how the idea started of like a coffee shop that serves these desserts by the unit. And this was truly the starting point of it. It's like, how, why don't we have a coffee shop in this area of Beirut that gives access to Lebanese desserts and sweets by the unit? And this is how the... Levant project started um, about a year and a half ago. And if I understand it correctly, so you're solving a problem and it's a tourist area as well as an area for locals and you're not a coffee guy. I don't have a background of coffee initially. 
um, my background is computer engineering, but I've been a coffee um, snob. I'm a- <laughs> or in way uh, for three years now. Yeah, I think it yeah, started correct. right before the pandemic. Uh, uh, I, w- I started like working in some coffee shops right before the lockdown, and then once I I tasted I tasted like a really 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 good coffee, and it was the first time where I bought beans from a coffee shop. Uh, <laughs> we all have I, that I, moment, I, right? <laughs> I did not even have a grinder back then. I just bought this, back up, you know, I, I thought that I'll figure it out. And, yeah. and, and you did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, some y- a few years later, I, I have my coffee shop now. So, yeah, they, they hooked me. They hooked me in. And, and that really leans into the story behind being a business owner, right? Like you just adapt and learn as you go, especially in small business and first time small business ownership. And then, so you open a year and a half ago. In in this discussion, in this episode, we're going to talk about what did life look like for Levant before it, it before the crisis, and we can def- or the war. And the war isn't just what happened in Lebanon. The war affected the war in Gaza affected you uh, in Jmezi before the war in Lebanon did. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to compare that to like how do you adapt immediately afterwards. So in in this episode, that's what we're going to talk about. So tell me what business was like for you before the war in Gaza started. So, uh, we, the project, like the idea of the project, it really emerged, uh, two years ago. Uh, so I saw, I started like, uh, thinking about it and then, uh, figuring out the, the, how would the plan look like and how would the coffee shop look like and, and all of this, uh, the, uh, we started doing the works around May, uh, 2023, mm-hmm. uh, to try to open during the summer of 2023. Uh, some delays happened and we ended up opening beginning of September 2023. Now, during this period in, in Lebanon, we we had like the financial uh, crisis that started in 2019 and then the pandemic hit, then the explosion of uh, the port of Beirut. So it was quite a tough period. However, in 2023, there was like this window of about six to 10 months where things were starting to get back to normal. The mm-hmm. financial crisis had stabilized a bit. Restaurants were reopening again, uh, bars, coffee shops, um, expats were coming back, tourists were visiting again. So there was this window where uh, we had an stability or maybe an illusion of stability so this is this the new normal it, yes so it was the period where uh, i decided to open levant and started working on it at this moment uh beirut was being reconstructed after the the explosion of the port jemaise was prettier than ever because all the buildings were uh, newly painted newly renovated mm. tourists were visiting everyone wanted to see beirut again So things were happening. And so this was the moment where uh, I decided to work on on this project uh, to have this coffee shop that would be serving all the people walking in the streets, the tourists, the expats who come back to Beirut twice or three times a year and like to walk around in these streets. And so this is how it started. Uh, I opened beginning of September. There was a lot of traffic uh, in the street. So you would sit at Levant and every 10, 15 minutes, there would be like a group of people passing by, mm-hmm. a group of tourists, a group of expats. So when we talk about a touristic area in Beirut, it's not really like a touristic area in Paris or Barcelona where you have a constant flux of people where you have like maybe hundreds of people passing by the hour. A touristic area in Beirut is uh, as... The best it can get is a group of foreigners every 15 minutes, mm-hmm. which is already like a great. Uh, uh, it's good for, of, for a business. Uh, yes. 
So there's like the foreigners, there's the expats. So when I say expats, like the Lebanese expats living abroad, there are many Lebanese living abroad and they often come back to Beirut. There are some businesses as well in the area. So this was the initial plan. And when I opened in September, uh, it was going the, in the direction that I was imagining. So we opened. Uh, I put all these Arabic and Lebanese sweets with uh, the the Lebanese coffee that we serve in the mm -hmm. Rakwe, it's a break mm -hmm. in, the, in the specialty coffee world. Uh, and people were passing by, some locals, some foreigners. Uh, during the days, it was about 40% of the revenue was actually coming from foreigners. And it was going in, in this direction. And then the... The war on, on Gaza started on October 7 and uh, in Lebanon as well on October 8. So the recent escalations uh, started about a month ago, but the ongoing war has been going on here for, for over a year, uh, but not in Beirut at first. So when it started in Gaza, it took several days for people to realize what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. And so it was... I been open for about uh, five or six weeks and you know I was starting to build up the momentum mm -hmm. and then in, in a matter of few days all the momentum that I was trying to build um, collapsed so you would see less and less people in the street and within a week there was no foreigner at all anymore in Beirut wow wow and was the moment where um we had to sit and think about, okay, so what do we do now? This was one of the main target, about 40% of the revenue was based on this. Um, the moment of panic as a business owner, right? Like there's so much excitement at the beginning of a business, so much hope at the beginning of a business. And when you see it starting to work and then something outside of you crashes the plan, what does that feel like as a business owner? It's the, uh, it's a scary moment because you've put so much effort and energy and love in, in a place. Mm. Uh, and because as you're saying, it's something that's not at all under your control. So mm. uh, there is really little you can do about it. So at first, the first reaction is like, it's a bit of a shock. It's like, okay, I... I don't know. You just, it takes actually, Yeah. the first time it happens, it does take several days to start really like being able to think about it. At mm -hmm. first, it's very reactive. It's like, okay, just go there and wait for something to happen. But then you realize nothing is happening. Unfortunately, we live in a, in a country that has seen a lot. And uh, I remember this this day where I was like sitting at the cafe and my father was here as well. And I'm like, I'm talking with him. And I'm like, what do I do now? There was mm -hmm. like some day where I was closing at $20 uh, of sales for the whole day. So this is not even enough to cover the, the cost of the day. And he says in a very detached way, it's like, you just close. And I think this was the moment where it made me realize, um, Two things, I think. First is that, uh, okay, it, it, something's happening, but uh, other generations and other people have had it really worse. And mm -hmm. that as much as, uh, as much as I'm attached to this place, there is this like worst case scenario that is you know, closing and that it's not the end of the world. And once you kind of realize that even the worst case scenario is not that bad. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it's fine if you just close the business. You can just open another one later on. It kind of liberates you from that stress of not knowing what should I do. And then this is how you start. It's like, okay, the worst case scenario is closing. I don't want to close. And so like, what can I start doing in order not to close? And this is where you start adapting and then um, coming up with ideas and ways of uh, of adapting to the new way of 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 consuming uh, of 
people, of customers, etc. It sounds like a really pivotal moment where you're sitting in your business with your dad, uh, who comes from a generation that have experienced a lot, and the resilience that they've had to cultivate is something that perhaps at a time he was doing, trying things like you're trying things and building things like you're building things. And the resilience that he's cultivated to come to this really kind of milestone moment in your life where you are beginning to make your mark in the world. And the one thing he passes on to you is it's no matter what happens, you've got many options because you can just close. How does that impact you as somebody who sees that there's, like, when I say there's a journey ahead, I don't mean like for every business owner because we're still talking at the time of what's gone in Gaza. We're not talking about what came next, which was the bombing in Beirut, the constant bombing and continuous bombing. We're recording this on November 7. And it's not letting up. And yesterday, Trump won the election. So it doesn't sound like it's going to let up anytime soon. What happened? What does that mean to you when your father passes that on? And how does that then influence you? As you said, you, you know, you start thinking about, you know, customers and, and selling and, but does that give you confidence? Does it give you, does it remove? the any hope what what does it do um it's it's very um counterintuitive but really talking about the worst case scenario oh, does liberate wow. from it you know? wow yeah. and i think this was the effect of it is like yeah the worst case scenario is just closing right and once you you phrase it and you just say it out loud it, it liberates you from it and this is when you start Going into action. And going to action, yes. So what was the first thing that you did? So it was October last year. Uh, traffic was very low. The first days, uh, there was nothing that could be done up until we started realizing because the streets were really empty. So mm. I had to uh, think about... Uh, so many different things because there was like the cost and the employees and the stock and everything. Um, so after like after we had this discussion, I started thinking about what could Levant become and what are the small wins or the low hanging fruits that can mm. kind of save uh, as much as possible. So this was or what pushed us, for example, to uh, start having a listing on a local delivery app, which is Totters. So up until then, I up until then I did not, uh, um, I was not thinking about it. I knew that maybe at some point I would be on it, but uh, I didn't uh, action it. I hadn't actioned yet. So this gives you kind of time to start. Uh, it accelerates. Working. The things, yes. So it did accelerate uh, us be uh, moving on on that or like creating a, a a listing and having our products on on that platform, and uh, having also working on the the takeaway packaging as well. For me, most of the traffic was gonna be um, dine in, but mm -hmm. then people weren't seeing a lot in Beirut, so I had to also work on on the takeaway packaging. Because this was, uh, I hadn't planned that it would be that important during during this period. And up until um, up until like few weeks after it started, this is where people started to understand. Okay, what is happening? What does that mean? Can we still can we go to Beirut from time to time? Uh, but then by these weeks. The people of, of Beirut had changed a lot. So no tourists anymore, no foreigners, expat had went back to their countries. And you only had the Beirutis that mm. live in Beirut who are here. 
And this is where I had to start thinking about, okay, what does the bond mean for them? And so then a year later, so you, you find a new normal again, and then a year later, just a few weeks ago, the devastating situation where Beirut starts getting bombed. What happens then for your business? So back then, when I had to readapt, uh, I had to uh, meet the local the locals uh, in like halfway, meaning that maybe that the locals aren't that much interested of having a local Swiss because I mean they could have from time to time, but this is not something that you would be having every day. So I right. needed to offer something that would uh, that would meet like the local need, which is what pushed me to elevate more the coffee and the beverage experience. So back then I only had uh, Lebanese coffee mm -hmm. as an offering. So I had in time of, of, of crisis and war to reinvest more, which is also very counterintuitive, but mm. to get her coffee machine, a grinder, the full of equipment. So the reasoning was that you can't have sweets every day, but you can drink coffee or, uh, or even tea every day. And this is, this was the moment where I had to push this further and have inverse like the ratio of beverage to food that I had expected initially. I was hoping to sell sweet and coffee as a side. So I was like a pastry shop that has the Lebanese coffee. Mm -hmm. It was, I'm becoming a coffee shop that serves Lebanese pastries. So truly the coffee would be at the, at the center. And the, the other thing that I had to do is try to transform the space to become uh, of a community space, of a place where you don't just come for the coffee, you come for a company, you come to see comfort, you come to change your thoughts, you come for culture. And this is what had me, uh, like this is how I, I started relying more on, a, on locals and mm. this is how I started shifting from what initially was supposed to be the plan versus what it became. Because at first Levant had also a, uh, a touristic aspect to it where I was hoping that it would be a bit of a touristic speakeasy where mm -hmm. people would come and then start planning their trip in Lebanon and their different uh, uh, excursions and where there might be like a departing, departing bus every morning from Levant to a certain region in Lebanon. Mm. So when this happened, we started serving coffee in a more advanced way. We started creating some sort of gatherings so that people can, can gather around. Uh, and then these gatherings were like calligra Arabic calligraphy workshops, poetry nights, uh, sketching, painting classes. And people were loving it. So this is how the community started growing. And coming back to what happened uh, about six weeks ago in Beirut, when the the escalation really started and mm. was being bombed, uh, it was very similar to what happened a year ago, although it was even more intense. So what was similar is that something external happened on which you, we didn't have any control. What was different is that there was already no foreigners in Beirut and not only uh, the expats left, but also some of the locals started leaving. So yeah, some wow. people left Beirut. So, and then some people even left Lebanon. So even the most regular people who would come every week or every day to Levant are not here anymore. Right. And so if, if I understand you correctly, from five weeks after you've opened, the challenges are forcing you constantly to reassess and reassess and reinvent 
and pivot and cultivate more resilience to now where we are today in November, where you are still trying to figure out how to make decisions so that you can continue to grow your business and you haven't given up at all. Okay. Join us for the next episode, folks, Uh, because we're going to talk in this next episode about how you approach prioritizing decision-making once you've realized that you're in a war and you're running a business and you've decided you're not going to shut down. Join us for that episode. Joseph, this has been a fantastic conversation. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon, and stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Forward.